Thank you all again for joining. We're really excited to be bringing you um, this beginner series with Melt and Pour Do's and Don'ts. Um, Pramila, can you can you hear okay, or is it just the audio that you're? It's not coming from you. Let me see if I can help with that. Okay. If anyone else has audio issues or can't hear, feel free to drop it in the chat, um, and I can help navigate. Um, I will be your co-host. My name is Jessica. It's so nice to meet all of you. Um, Terry Bartlett is our amazing presenter. She specializes in melt and pour soap. Um, and she's gonna be going over general advice for this type of soap making, uh, mistakes to avoid, bases. She'll be going over embeds and colorants and additives um, and just kind of addressing the soap world in general. I think there's some real nuances to to soap groups and in groups in general. So she'll be talking about all of that. And we're really excited to have her on today. So I will just go ahead and hand it over to you. Thanks so much for joining us, Terry. Thank you, Jessica. It's so exciting. I was so pleased to be asked. Um, I'm going to start off just with a little bit about uh, the differences between cold process and melt and pour because there was some confusion in some of the questions that were being sent um, for in, into Jessica for this tutorial. So I just want to make it clear that when you make cold process, so you're combining the oils and the lye solution to create soap. They are saponified. The oils become saponified. When we're using melt and pour, it's already done for us. We don't have to do that. And the only reason I'm bringing that up is because there's a lot of discussion about adding things into our soap, um, into melt and pour. And you can add small amounts of, of things, but if you're not careful, you can destroy that saponification um, of those oils. And then it's no longer soap or it doesn't set up properly or it's bad for your skin or a variety of things can happen. So I wanted to, to just let you know that that's that's one of the main differences and really the only one we need to talk about here um i'm going to talk a little bit about starting out because that's what uh we that's what we were talking about with this live is is getting started and some of the do's and don'ts and one of my biggest do's is to learn as much as you can and I mean, to me, it was fun learning when I started out and got the, the hair just to, oh, I wanna make some soap for myself for my skin is very sensitive and I didn't like what I was using and it was causing me all kinds of problems. My dad had, uh, was diagnosed with stage four melanoma and having red hair and having grown up in Florida, I had a really high risk for that myself. So uh, I wanted to look into taking more control over what I was putting on my skin. And in, in that learning, that first learning stage, I, I would experiment a little and then I would go watch a bunch of YouTube videos. And I just want to caution you a little bit. There are some really good tutorials out there for Mountain Core, but there also are some that are questionable um, and they're not even they're not always formatted as tutorials, but some of them are. Uh, the ones you see that are uh, life hacks, 50 great things to do with mountain pour soap, or you know, make these great craft projects, and then the, a lot of them are soap related there. Please don't watch those or watch them and look at that and say most of, tell yourself most of these are what not to do because you'll see some where people add aloe plants, um, which is really bad. You can't add plants. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later additives because I don't want to get into a big controversy about it. But um, the one, one of them I saw, they put an aloe plant in the blender with the spines and everything. And I can just imagine using that very scratchy, rotten soap. I didn't, I wouldn't want to. So um, take care where you learn. Um, Pinterest has some beautiful, beautiful soaps and mo a lot of them are not achievable um, without causing harm or they just won't last um, the way the picture looks. You'll see it 
look beautiful with floral petals and pretty stuff in it. And then a week later, it's rotten and gross. And we'll talk a little more about that later too. But um, look, YouTube is good, but you want to uh, look for people like that, that that's all they have on their uh, channel uh, is soap or um, it's nice, the ones that specifically do mountain pour. Koala Soaps is one of my favorites. She's fabulous with especially like beginning techniques and just, uh, and she experiments a bit too, and you can kind of get some more advanced techniques from her, but she's very uh, no nonsense about it. She's, she's, uh, she gives you really good instruction on, on what to do, how much fragrance oil, et cetera, that kind of thing, uh, or what she does anyway. And that's the, what I like to do when I'm teaching something about soap is this is what I do. I can't tell you what to do, but I can just tell you what I recommend. And you, you know, you do your research and you do you because, uh, you know, it's a very personal thing. If you're making it for yourself, you, you know, you've got to do what you need to do. So the next thing, I guess I'm, I'm following a little list here because otherwise I won't remember what I'm talking about. Um, one of the first things you do when you're going to make a uh, mountain pour is you look to purchase a base unless you are really crafty enough and you've already been making soap for a while, uh, cold process soap, and you might make your own, which I'm not there yet. I don't know if I ever will be. Um, so I purchased my bases um, from reliable soap suppliers. Um, I know there's a lot of people out there, hobbyists and people just experimenting that will pick up some soap at Michael's or their soap kits at, at Target. Their soap kits um, in Hobby Lobby is a big one. They carry, they carry their own soap bases and I'm not putting them down at all. I just, just be aware that they're going to behave a little differently than some of the ones you would buy from a professional soap supply company. Um, and I've, I've just heard some that they can be difficult to work with. So, um, I won't give out lists of names of where I, where I get mine, but there's a lot of really nice brands, um, out there. And I can tell you, if I told you my favorite, that's just my favorite. You have to get samples. I suggest getting samples. You don't have to, I suggest getting samples because you can waste a lot of money real quick by buying, thinking you're gonna buy a big whole 10 pound or 24 pound block of soap and you get it and you hate it. Um, and a lot of money can go down the tubes really quickly doing that. So I'd suggest looking at samples and I would also suggest trying samples from different companies and different soaps within that company. Um, for a starter, I would, look at doing uh, having a nice clear soap if you want to do designs especially um, you want something with really good clarity um, i would look at then having something that maybe matches your skin type as best you can maybe you have dry skin you want to look for something that's um, one of the buttery type bases three butters or shea butter or goat's milk there's so many out there but keep in mind if you're going to buy only goat's milk soap that's going to limit your design possibilities. I was hugely attracted to Melton Pour Soap because of the transparency and the design possibilities with that. I've always been really attracted to glass art and just things like that that I could see through. I don't know why, but that's where I am. I'm gonna grab a sip of water real quick. So I can feel my throat getting all yucky. And so on, on the basis, uh, back to the basis. When you get the kinds you want to try and experiment with first, really pay close attention to what the manufacturer says about them. So you want to look when you're ordering, do they tell me what the melting temperature is? Is, is probably the most important thing uh, for learning how to use it. Um, and, and what's in it, look at what's in it because they're all, they're all a bit different. Uh, in addition to having a nice clear soap and maybe something more luxurious. I'd also recommend maybe looking at trying one of the detergent free soaps because there's a lot of beautiful detergent free soaps out there. Um, and that way you can, it's a little more flexible with where you can use it. To me, I don't, I make a lot of really clear designer soaps, but I don't use those on my face. 
Uh, the detergent free soaps, though, most of them I can use on my face without a problem. Um, so those are some things to keep in mind. The, the melting temperature is extremely important because if you overheat it, it causes so many problems. And that's one of the biggest mistakes I see with uh, new soapers starting out. Um, and when I say new, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't been doing it for years and years and years. I've just been full on doing it for two and a half years. Um, and I dove in really quick and I did a lot of research and practice. Um, but I see it, new people coming into the soap groups I'm in and asking questions. And um, a lot of times the problems that they're having uh, with their soap sweating or uh, their embeds melting or it not lathering properly, a lot of that is because they've overheated the soap uh, or if it set, starts setting up on you really quickly, sometimes it's because it's been overheated. Um, and that leads me to another thing that can cause problems with your base is if you add a bunch of stuff. We already talked about that that's what cold process soapers do. That's what they have to do. And they, they can add all kinds of things in there as it's turning into soap. Once it's turned into soap, there's only certain things you can add. Um, if you add a bunch of oil, your soap isn't gonna set up properly or you will lose uh, the lather. Um, and lather's a whole other subject. Um, there's a variety of things that can affect it, a huge variety. Um, your water, what type of water do you have, hard water or soft water? And that's out of the maker's control. If I make a soap and you buy the soap from me, um, I don't know if you have hard water or soft water, but hard water makes it more difficult for it to lather. Cold water makes it more difficult for it to lather. I always suggest having warm water when you're washing your hands. Um, that's usually the only place I see people having cold water, maybe, um, unless you take cold showers, that's on you. Um, but um, salt can affect the lather. It doesn't mean you can't make a salt bar with soap. You can, and it will, it can lather, but you just have to be careful about it. Um, Epsom salts, don't add that to your soap. We'll, we'll get into don't adds later, but that's not great. Um, it'll turn to mush kind of, but if you're using Epsom salts, let's say you're taking a nice bath for soaking, for soaking your back or my back um, or whatever, you, if you're using soap in the bath, because you're more than soaking and you just want to wash up or whatever, it's not going to suds as well when you have Epsom salts in there. Um, so your soap isn't broken. It's just, let's see. Okay. Oh, too much fragrance oil can do the same thing. can cause the soap not to lather properly. It's also can be really bad for your skin or for somebody else's skin. If you're making soap to sell, um, that can, that can really irritate some people's skin. Go with the uh, IFRA rates, uh, the usage rates suggested for each individual fragrance oil. That means when you purchase the fragrance oil, you want to look up how much fragrance oil is recommended for per pound of soap is usually the way they do that. And you want to make note of that somewhere so you don't have to go look it up every single time, but you do have to, it does vary from fragrance to fragrance and company to company. If I buy cool water from Wellington, it the usage rate might be different than if I buy cool water from Fragrance Buddy or, or one of those. So um, keep in mind that, that, that you have to look every time you buy a different one. I try to write it on my bottle so I don't have to look every time um what is there about fragrances else i was going to say oh you've got to make sure they're skin safe this comes with also with uh purchasing fragrances and colorants um a lot of newbies will find really good deals on amazon or other little side companies maybe that have stuff please make sure they are skin safe um I'm not putting Amazon down. I buy way too much from Amazon, a lot of things, um, but I won't buy um, unless I know the company that's selling it, which sometimes you you know see a recognized company. I won't buy micas or colorants or fragrance oils or anything like that that might be uh, more intended for candles 
or more intended for resin. The colorants, a lot of micas are intended for resin and art projects, glitters. There are plenty of glitters out there that say eco-friendly or whatever, but they also have to be soap safe. So those kind of additives, you don't wanna just purchase anywhere. You wanna try to get a, uh, find a reputable company that sells other soap products. Um, let's see what else were we talking about. Okay, so while we're on colorants and fragrances, finding when you get the base you like and you, you decide if you want a fragrance, you don't have to add fragrance, obviously, but a lot of people love the fragrance and a lot of people who actually sell say that's what sells it for them is the fragrance is really important. So once you find the fragrance and the usage rate and what colorants you want to use, um, you, have to, you have to plan out your design and you have to think about the colors, what types of colorants are going to be best for that design. Liquid dyes, liquid soap dyes are awesome. They're gorgeous and beautiful. And see if I have an example. I mean, they're super, super clear. You can see, and you probably can't see through. That's just a plain bar of clear soap, but you can see right through it. It's gorgeous. Just like stained glass, but they will bleed. So if, if you have a design you want and you're putting an embed in and it's got one color of stained glass or well stained glass is a brand name but of liquid dye and and then you've got the surrounding soap is another color and then you have another embed that's another color and you've used liquid dyes a lot of times you're going to have the colors bleed and you won't you a lot of people won't realize what's going on but that the color just bleeds from one into the other and orange into green is not pretty and you end up with a brown yucky soap sometimes um, or the the overall picture of the soap just is unclear because it gets really fuzzy. Um, so micas are what I tend to use when I'm doing an embed. Uh, they tend to bleed less. Most micas don't bleed at all. Um, reds have a tendency to sometimes bleed a little bit more. Um, so I'm just a little cautious sometimes with how much mica I'm adding for an embed. If I'm using red, it will um eventually it may not right away but eventually it will bleed out a little bit most of them i i've not found one that hasn't way down the road so um that that does that part of the design process is is uh important as far as the colorants go um there are natural colorants you can use and depending on the type of design you're you're planning, you can, you can use clays, you can use charcoal, activated charcoal, make sure it's skin safe. Um, you can use cocoa powder, you can use uh, turmeric in small amounts. Um, titanium dioxide, a lot of people will add that for white to make it white. It will obviously change the clarity if you're talking about a clear design. Um, and most of those other the powder type colorants like that will as well. Um, pigments, micas, Micas, I kind of think they fall a little in the middle as far as clarity goes. You can get some clarity still using micas. You just use a very small amount. And uh, a trick I learned a long time ago in playing, playing around with it is if I want to slightly color using micas, let's say I want a pale kind of blue, um, I'll use a darker blue and then just put a very tiny amount um, or a, a really vibrant blue. Like I won't go for a pale blue necessarily mica to give me a pale blue soap because it's not gonna happen if the amounts I'm talking about are very, very minuscule. And with any colorant, you wanna make sure you mix it with something before you add it in. You can just pour it in. I, that's, I won't say you can't because it's possible. Um, it's just harder to mix in. So it's gonna form little bubbles and clumps. And uh, if that happens, you can spritz the top with a little bit of rubbing alcohol. It will help it to disperse and you can do that. I usually am in a little bit more of a hurry. I like to stir it in before it cools the soap down, even though I usually use a soap that doesn't cool so fast, but still just you want as much working time as possible. So, um, you can mix the pigment, you can mix micas and pigments and such with rubbing alcohol. I suggest 91% or 99 for that. Um, and well, we'll get 
to embeds later, but we also use rubbing alcohol if you're not aware to spritz bubbles. When you pour soap, you get falls into there, you get a bunch of bubbles on the top. That spray of alcohol, usually just one spritz and they go away. Um, and it's also used for sticking layers and for uh, helping your embeds to adhere properly. So we'll get a little further down, we'll get into that. Okay, so colorants and fragrance, the uh, part of your design. Sorry, I'm rambling here. Just want to make sure I know where I am. Vanillin, there we go. I knew there was another thing I was leaving out with fragrance. Any fra fragrance with vanillin in it is going to brown your soap or turn it a, a, a color, usually kind of a brown or a yellowish. Um, that's, it's not pretty if you don't plan on on it to be that way. I, a lot of times if I'm using a soap with a high vanillin content, we'll plan, okay, this soap is gonna be, a, I don't know, I don't, not a, I don't make cinnamon roll soaps, but um, that's one of the things that comes in mind because some people make those and please don't use real cinnamon. Um, but a brown color isn't gonna hurt anything if you're doing a gingerbread soap or something that, that it won't bother, won't affect the design. Um, there are uh, vanilla stabilizers that you can use. Sorry, there's a little bug in here. Um, look up what's in them if you can. I, a lot of times the companies just call it fragrance. There's other stuff in there, but they can just call it fragrance because it becomes part of the fragrance when you mix it. And legally, they don't have to tell you what's in it if it's a fragrance. So, um, I've used it and I've not been bothered by it, but I've heard there's some questionable things in there. So that's your decision to make on your own. Um, if, if you're not sure about the vanilla or vanillin content, look at the manufacturer's website. That's one of the other things you wanna always do is know where you got something and do they have good information on it? Just like with the bases, you want the melting point and what's in it and that type of thing with the fragrance oils that will tell you how much you can use, how much vanillin is in it. And typically um, really low amounts of vanillin, it's gonna be a very long time before you ever see any color change. Um, but I mean like less than 1%, like 0.5%, but it can still turn your soap. And uh, some people, some schools of thought say that it will always eventually turn your soap. It may be three years down the road if you have something sitting on your shelf that long, but um, the higher the vanillin content, the usually the faster that will appear. And it's very disappointing if you've planned it to be a beautiful daytime scene or something and you've got this beautiful blue sky and then you add the fragrance oil in and you go to pour it and the next day it's awful brown. That's heartbreaking because usually that type of soap is a lot of work. Um, so the other thing about fragrance oil in, in any kind of soap, but melt and pour particularly, is you wanna look at the, um, at the flash point of the, of the fragrance oil, which just means you don't wanna add the fragrance oil at that temperature or higher. It's not gonna catch anything on fire. The word flash point used to freak me out. It's just, going to disperse quickly and you're going to lose all your fragrance and it's a waste of money. So um, most of those are pretty high. Um, I find that I don't, I don't take my soap bases really high anyway. I like to go on the lower end of things. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little more about that when we get to the embeds, but um, I don't usually get to a point where those flash points are relevant. There are a few fragrances that go that their flash points 140. So that's kind of riding that line. I don't usually go above 140 with my soap bases, but occasionally it happens on accident. Um, so you just have to check what is your flash point of your fragrance oil so you can keep all that fragrance in the soap and not have it just poof in the air and gone. Oh boy, I talk a lot, don't I? Um, I'm hoping that some of this is uh, informative to you. Let's move to clarity, because while we were talking about the fragrance oils and the colorants, 
Clarity is something that if you're using Mountain Pour and you want uh, good designs, Clarity is it. That's what you want to do. So you can see the picture. So you can see these beautiful embeds you make. I'll show you, let's see, I'll show you a couple of mine just for an example. This is one of my soaps and you can really see the clarity. Yeah, if I turn it sideways, you can kind of see through it. But you can see right through to the picture. Um, that's my uh, Florida Christmas tree soap. Um, let's show one more that shows good clarity. Let's see. You can kind of see, well, yeah. You can see the picture really well, I think. I'm not sure. The lighting isn't the best for this, so forgive my bad camera knowledge. But you can, uh, hopefully you can get an idea what I was talking about with that. Um, if you're putting in all these embeds, you want to see that picture, you want clear soap. Um, there are remedies, not remedies, well, I guess. If, if your soap gets a little fuzzy looking when you pour that fragrance oil in, that's always freaks me out a little. Um, but keep stirring, keep stirring. If you stir it more than you think you need to, a lot of times it will clear right up. Um, if it doesn't, and it's maybe a little hazy, uh, it might be that you've put too much fragrance oil in. That's something else. Watch that fragrance oil usage um, for soap. It's not the same thing. The usage rate is not the same for every product you make. So make sure you check for soap. Um, if you put in the amount intended for perfumes, it's usually way higher and you'll really wreck your soap. But um, if, if you haven't put too much fragrance oil in and it's going to mix in and be fine, but maybe it's a little yellow or a little hazy still, um, tiniest bit. This is called bluing. It's not my invention. This is just a great technique. Tiniest bit of blue liquid dye. And I wouldn't even do a drop unless I had a great big old bucket or a big vat of soap um, going on. But maybe take a toothpick and dip it into your dye or put a drop out and just touch it barely and stir that into the soap. And if you need to dip another toothpick in or the other end or whatever, go and, and you know, go for that, but better to have too little than too much. Um, but it, believe it or not, we'll clear it up. It's kind of an illusion, but it, it brings a lot of clarity to the soap. It's kind of counteracts the yellow a little. And um, I've seen it work wonders. It's kind of saved my butt more than once. So that's one way to keep it really super clear. You're the base you choose. If you choose a base that when you when it comes to you is really not transparent, it's very unlikely that it's going to just clear up magically when you melt it. It most of them will clear up a little bit when you melt them because there's some. First of all, you're usually not using the huge chunk that you have, but um, it's it's a really cloudy looking soap. It is it may be translucent but it's not gonna be super transparent and it's certainly not gonna be really super crystal clear. Um, look around, I, I um, don't wanna give, you know, throw out brands I use or whatever, but look around and look at the clarity um, level. A lot of the companies will say how clear it is or give it some type of rating. Um, and usually the ones that are more clear are the, the ones that have detergent in them, which I'm fine with that, it doesn't bother my skin. Um, they're usually very mild detergents, by the way, uh, but that some of the stuff that is put into the soap to clear it up um, are, are make it not detergent free. So um, there's that. If you overheat your, your base, that's another thing that can that it can affect is the clarity. Uh, we already I already mentioned that it will make it do up, that it might not set up properly or might set up too fast on you and dry out. Um, but it will also affect the clarity and make your soaps a little fuzzy looking. Um, it, and another thing that will do the overheating is melt your embeds. So this leads me to the embed discussion. Hopefully um, I can give you some information here that will help you. It's, it's a huge subject. Um, I do plan to uh, start a YouTube channel with tutorials and you know actually show me making something instead of sitting at my piano with all my 
mess behind me. Um, but the uh, embeds, I, I mean, I could just do tutorial after tutorial after tutorial on embeds and embed types. So I'm just gonna touch on them a little bit. Um, where I already mentioned, don't use the liquid soap colorants in them unless you want them to bleed. Sometimes you do. Um, this one doesn't have liquid colorant, but I wouldn't mind if this one bled a little bit because I did a variegated look. So if that purple starts bleeding into the lighter purple, starts bleeding into the white, I'm not going to mind that so much because that's the intended look of it. But most soaps, you're not wanting it to bleed. Um, so using micas, um, especially from a good source, uh, what kind of embeds, how do you make it? Somebody just asked a while back, like, how do you make embeds? That's such a big, uh, basket of material. Um, you can use molds. There's all types of molds for embeds, silicone molds. I really recommend silicone molds. Nothing against plastic molds. People have you been using them for many years, and I've even used them for a few things. They're just harder to get out and harder to manipulate to me. So um, I prefer the silicone molds. If you're looking for sometimes an embed that you're looking to put in a soap might come in a mold that's bigger than it's going to fit in your in your shape that you're doing, unless you're doing a big loaf or um you know if you're doing like a small circle or an oval or something and you find those embeds are too big i recommend looking at embeds uh i'm sorry not embeds molds for fondant they are hard to use but once you get the hang of it it's really not that bad um they make really teeny tiny embeds and um i'll, I'll i probably will do a tutorial on how to do that but I find many more tools for fondant, like you know the cake icing that's really thick, and they and people cover their cakes with it, and then they cut shapes with their icing and decorate the cakes. Look it up if you haven't seen them. Look up the YouTube, whatever YouTube channel person makes great cakes. I don't know because I don't watch that. But there are some beautiful cakes out there with gorgeous decoration that's not being piped from a frosting bag just like little shapes that they press the sugary kind of fondant in there and they get these gorgeous thing shapes well those will also cut soap if you set everything up properly really really thin cutters the, i mean the cutters that use really thin sheets of soap as thin as you can possibly make them pretty much and you let that set up and then you can take the fondant cutter or a very small cookie cutter, you can find those. Um, I like the metal ones that are cookie cutters just because they're a thinner blade sort of, and they don't mush out a bunch of soap as you're pressing it in. Um, but I've done so many soaps using little tiny fondant cutters. And you think, oh wow, that's gonna take hours. It really doesn't take that long because you're plunging a bunch of them. You're not doing it when it's wet, waiting for it to set up like you are with the fondant molds where you pour it and you do have to wait. So if you're gonna use fondant molds, if you're making a lot of them, buy a lot of molds. Um, let's see if I have some examples here. The little leaves in this guy, the little leaves are fondant mold and the tree is also a fondant mold. Very difficult to kind of to work with, but once you get the hang of it, it's not so bad. There's some tricks I'll teach you when I do a tutorial. Um, see if I have a cutter mold. Well, I wasn't smart enough to bring my cutter molds or my cutter soaps with um, with little cutters. But yeah, there's a little one in here. So my sun in the sunset, it's just a half circle, which isn't too difficult to find, but I just I just poured uh, a thin layer of gold and then I take a circle cutter and I cut it and I cut it in half and that's just the way I make my sons. Um, the, the leaves in the palm tree, the leaves are an actual little leaf fondant mold, very small. I just cut them in half and it gives me the shape I want for the palm tree. 
Um, so that's that's another thing I wanted to touch on with embeds is please think outside the box. This is your time to get creative. I much prefer to see people getting creative with ways to make embeds than in like adding a bunch of stuff to soap that isn't going to necessarily do it any good and might cause someone harm in the long run. Um, is this guy, I don't know if you can see this very well as of the lighting. There's a tree in the background there, and that's the same tree I use in my fall soap. This is a, this was my Halloween, my little spooky graveyard. Um, but the, the reason I'm showing you is the little ghosts. I don't know if you can see the little ghosties. That was just pouring really thin sheets of soap. And I tore a little square, like a little mini hanky, and I just took my gloved little finger and just put it right on there and shaped it the way I wanted to, plopped it in the soap. So when I say plop it in the soap, when you're talking about embeds, you got to know what's the temperature, what is it going to do to that embed when you plunge it in there. Um, and it, you know, because that's such a thin piece of soap. If you have it too hot, it's going to be gone. It's going to just disappear and cloud your soap up because it will all melt. Um, but if you're careful, you can do it. I will usually spritz my embeds with alcohol before I put them in. Not only will it help it adhere in the soap, but it also will give it a little bit of a layer of coolant, and it won't it won't be as hot when you're you know, popping it in. But I also pay really close attention to how hot I'm pouring. Um, people ask that a lot about the pouring temperature with embeds. Um, and I can't give you an exact number because every soap is different where that melting point is. But I can say this, when I'm doing embeds and when I'm doing layers and when I'm doing swirls, um, I tend to ride around that melting point if here's my melting point i want it to adhere so sometimes i'll have that soap that's being poured a little above that melting point and you don't want to go too far because then it's gone but if you just a tiniest bit above that melting point and you spritz with alcohol and you spritz your embed with alcohol and it it can work um I can talk a little bit more about that when I do some tutorials for specific soaps because every every embed is also a little different. The thinner the embed, more likely it is going to melt. So keep keep that in mind. If you're doing a bigger chunk or you're putting more embeds in at once, you're going to be cooling that soap a lot faster. Um, doing shredded soaps or confetti soaps, whatever you want to call them, where you take either a block of soap that you intentionally color some color and you shred it with a cheese shredder cheese grater, um, which by the way, if you do, please don't use the same cheese grater that you use to grate your cheese. Um, even if you wash it, there's gonna be remnants. So have like separate equipment for everything you do. Don't you let your kitchen bleed over into your soap. Um, just not um, healthy. <laughs> um, so uh, the shreds, because and, and you don't have to make a block of separate soap. I sometimes take a failed soap. Yes, I make plenty of failed soaps too, just like everybody. Um, and I'll shred it up and use that in another soap, if unless it's like really ugly. Um, but usually there's some color left and something, you know, and as long as you're kind of aware of what the fragrance is, you can usually mix a lot of them together unless you're, you know, going to get some nasty fragrance that just doesn't work together but always smell first <laughs> um when you plunge those well let me tell you how i do my my uh, shredded soaps first a lot of people will put their shreds in and then pour soap over them i don't do it that way it may be wrong i don't know but that's what i do is i pour my soap first and i pour about halfway or a little bit more and then i take gloved fistfuls <laughs> of the shreds I want and I cram them in and I use a uh, uh, not a skewer I always call them bamboo skewers and that's not the word I'm looking for <sighs> 
some type of stir. I'll think of the word eventually. And, and just kind of move them around a little bit, but not too much because you don't want to melt them. But the minute you're putting a lot of some soap in there, a lot of embeds and shreds, it drops the temperature of the liquid soap immediately. Um, sometimes it will set even set it up so you kind of have to work quickly. Um, so I will have that slightly above the melting point. I don't want it, if I put it at the melting point or below, then it's probably going to set up faster than I can keep up with it. Um, just a side note on that, because a discovery I recently made is when you have a brand of soap and you think you know it really well and you've got the temperature down and you're feeling, you know, really, hey, I know how to do this. And then you switch to a detergent free of the same kind, it's going to be different. <laughs> and uh, so take note of that too, because it, the, the melting temperature being lower means you're going to pour it at a lower temperature, of course, but also means that if the embeds and the shreds are made of the same soap, their melting temperature is lower too. So just be aware and be mindful of that. Or if you're mixing, and yes, you can mix detergent free and regular or premium or supreme or whatever your whatever the company calls it, you can blend those. I have used shreds from one type of soap and a base from another and put them together. And that's where I ran into trouble because I wasn't paying attention to what the melting point of these shreds were. So, and it wasn't a, a horrible disaster. It actually looked kind of cool, but they started to melt and they were neon in color. So I was getting these little neat things, little clouds or wisps coming off of the neon shreds. So it looked great, but it wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't what I was looking for. It wasn't what my customer <laughs> was asking for, but there were no complaints. So. But that just to be aware that that, that difference is there. Um, let's see what else about embeds. Uh, let's see, small silicone molds, cookie cutters. We did that fondant cutter, shred it like cheese. Okay, that's all I can think of right now. Oh, wait, no, there's more. The flat, thin sheets I was talking about, you can do so much with those. Please, uh, if you're if you're interested in trying that, um, I'll do a tutorial. I'll do a tutorial. Um, I see that I've been talking for a very long time. It's hard to shut you me up. Love sometimes. it. Thank you so much. <laughs> it, I've learned an insane amount, and I want to make sure we have a few more minutes for questions. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So Angie asked, "What is a su suspension base?" Okay, a suspension base is made, and I forget what they add. There's an additive in the soap, and it's not harmful, um, but it creates, um, I don't even know what they call it, like almost like a network. You don't see it. You won't feel it in the soap. It's really usually nice on the skin. It will suspend. It will hold your additives. Let's say you want to put poppy seeds or something else that might float quickly or sink to the bottom. And a lot of little decorative additives will do that. And in a suspension base, it will keep them suspended in the soap. So it will, when the soap is solidified, they will be in the soap rather than floating on top or sinking to the bottom. Does that help? I think so. Um, Angie, if you have any other questions about that, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, but Tanya wanted to know if you had any suggestions on soap brands that don't thicken up too quickly. Um, I love Crafter's Choice for that. Um, they, I've, there are slight differences in their various types, but um, the, those tend to have a longer open time and the detergent free even more so. Uh, but I, I use the, the premium crystal clear a lot for the clarity and that has a really good open time as well but uh yeah the detergent free tend i don't know if that's that way with every soap brand that the detergent free has a more open time but it is with the crafter's choice which i use a lot of i don't use it solely but i use a lot of that one perfect and precious wants to know if she can use candle modes for soap molds if she cleans it well um, and avoids any sort of cross contamination. I don't know. I can't imagine why not if it's cleaned. I mean, the the biggest danger I would see with that are are they made of silicone? 
Um, she did not specify. Um, okay. Let's see. I mean, the temperature of the wax for for candles is much higher. So I would Im imagine it wouldn't hurt anything. Yeah. So she's using silicone molds. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Silicone molds can be used for so many things. Again, as long as there's no residue from anything, you might want to pour like a a soap that you're willing to toss <laughs> first, and it might it should adhere to that, and then and then go from there with a clean fresh start. Totally makes sense. Um, Ricky wants to know if the melt and pour bases work well when making and cutting from a loaf. Yes, yes, they do. Uh, they're, I mean, the techniques are very different. It's not going to be the same as as uh, cold process soap and what they can do in their loaves. But yes, you can do a lot of loaf soaps. I've got there's my oranges, orange ginger. Um, here's my sunset. That's all done with a loaf. There's a lot of what else is a loaf? Let's see. Oh, oh, here's one of my favorites. Oh, I'm going to show you a little trick real quick. Here's my, here's my winter wonderland. Watch this. This is fun for photos and for demos. You just spritz it with a little alcohol and it just pops, makes it all pretty clear. Yeah, that was in a loaf too. Um, yeah. Gorgeous. Wow. Thanks. Um, is, are there any other questions that anyone wants to chime in? Oh, so Sheena says, can botanicals be used in soaps? I don't recommend it. I'm not the soap police, so I can't tell you no, <laughs> but um, I will really don't recommend it. That Most of them will rot. There are things that I know to be safe um, and I have used, and I had a list somewhere here calendula petals are the only one that that i know of that tends to there are some people who use cornflower petals that's controversial some have had good luck some have not um you can use oats if they are rolled oats or steel cut not quick oats or instant those will rot uh, you can use colloidal oatmeal you can use uh coffee grounds if they're dried you don't want to use um if they're still wet from yeah that's not good uh you can use loofah you can use sea sponges you can use poppy seeds i would make sure that i would buy them from a soap supplier though not use them from your kitchen cabinet they're not the same um, apricot seed powder i've used again from a soap supplier pumice um, activated charcoal clays some essential oils um for fragrances if you wish but you have to be careful. The usage rate for essential oils is much, much lower, and it doesn't usually last longer, last as long as a fragrance oil in soap. Um, but you can anchor it with clay. Clay will anchor uh, essential oils a little better in your soaps. I hope that answered that. <laughs> yeah, I went off on some Thank long. Thank you. No, that's perfect. Well, Terry, we just want to thank you again for your time today. Um, it was so wonderful having you and hearing all that you had to offer to all of these amazing makers. I just love the community of soap makers, candle makers. Everyone is just so amazing. So thank you all for joining as well. Um, we will be doing a ton more live, so keep an eye out for more announcements. I will also be announcing the winner um, shortly after this live, so keep an eye on your emails. Thank you all so much for joining. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. Bye. That's cool. This is fun. <laughs> Bye, guys.